so happy that the Lord woke me up this morning, and I'm thankful that I'm alive Amen. to worship in the house of the Lord. Amen. And it's by His grace, it's a miracle of grace that I'm here, that I'm alive, that any of us are alive. It's only by the grace of God that we are here in church today. Amen. Without the grace of God subduing my sinful nature, there is no way I would be in church anywhere today or tomorrow or any other day. So praise God. Amen. He is worthy. Amen? Amen. How to handle claim jumpers. And you know, I, I went online to look for pictures, and, and all I could find was the big, uh, the big chocolate cake wedge that claim jumpers sells, you know, or, or the, the pictures of the claim jumpers' steaks and all that stuff. But I found a few, and here are some old-time gold miners. With the sleuth there and all that stuff going on. Man, you know that had to be a hard life. And, there was, and, and, and you could go, once you found a place that you thought was worth working on, you'd go back into town or the county seat and you'd file a claim and you'd make a declaration of where your claim was. And you'd have to drive a stake. You'd stake your claim. You'd drive a stake and maybe put your mark. If you couldn't write, you'd put your mark on it. And it would be your claim. But as crazy as it sounds, if you didn't have somebody to stay there and guard your claim while you went to town to file your claim, you might get back and find that your claim's gone. And somebody else has moved your stake and they've got a claim. And they had somebody in town, they, they were waiting and they had somebody in town that when they saw you coming into town, they went into the office, the, sur the surveyor's office, and they filed the claim just before you walked in the office. And that was a claim jumper. Well, we have a, well, there's an old cabin. I don't know how well you can see it. See the size of those logs? There's only one, two, three, four logs for that seven-foot-high wall. Now, I call that a log cabin. <laughs> not, too many, not too many people are going to be able to knock that cabin down. But that's, they'd live like that, those old miners. And, and this is the Amazon River. And when I saw that, I thought, man. There's a testimony right there that there's an enemy in this world. It looks like a snake to me. And he is the ultimate claim jumper in all the universe. And he is waiting hideously and insidiously to jump your life, to jump your claim. Even more than that, he operates and he works to jump the claims of God. Now somebody says, well, how can the devil jump the claims of God? Well, I want to show you how I believe he can do that. And he does do that. He has succeeded in doing it many times. In Ephesians 6, we, we uh, look into this battle from the New Testament point of view as far as dealing with claim jumpers. Now, I believe that God rightfully owns everything in the universe. Because he created it. And it rightfully belongs to him. But there's a thief. And he came along and he told our first parents something different than what God had claimed. God staked a claim in the Garden of Eden. And he told Adam and Eve, You belong to me, you're mine. I am yours. 
And as long as you do things out of love and, and truth and righteousness, we will be so happy and we'll have such an incredible experience together and nothing will ever harm us. And you can eat all you want of any tree, and, and including the tree of life, but there's this one tree that, represent, that, that, that represents choice and the choice to not love God, the choice to not have a loving relationship with the Creator. He says, if you eat of that tree, what you're telling me is you don't want to have me as your friend. Now, these are the claims of God. You're telling me that you do not want to follow me as your creator. You're telling me that you want to do it your own way instead of my way. And, and God gave them these informations. And he, he, he staked his claim and he declared his claims, the claims of God. Lucifer comes along in a snake, a serpent, and he's in that tree that they're not supposed to be eating of, and he says, God's claims are false. This tree will not cause any pain. Eating of this tree is not hurt, will not hurt you. In fact, it will help you. It will make you stronger. You won't die. That's, that's what God claims, but you won't die. You'll live forever. And you'll even be smarter, just like God. And they bought it. And he claim jumped God. Lucifer did. And that's how he did it. By getting them to follow him and his voice instead of the voice of the Creator. And there's only one way back into the arms of God. And we're going to look at that for a few minutes. In, in Ephesians 6, verse 10, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord. That, I can buy that. But in the power of his might? Now, this is a commandment from God. This word is in the imperative. This word says, You must be strong in the Lord, and it must be in his power and his might not your own. You must receive his power and his might for this battle that we're in. And that's a commandment, but it can only be produced and performed by the Lord himself, by the Holy Spirit. Put on the whole armor, of, not just 80% Christian, 90% Christian, 60, 51% Christian, all or nothing. You put all of Jesus on, or, you, or you're just playing games. You're going to be sadly disappointed. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, Adam and Eve were a whole lot smarter than us. They had no sin blight on them, no curse. Their brains were operating at maximum efficiency and full potential. And they were superhumans because they'd never had sin in them. We've all had sin in us. We've got things working against us that we don't even understand. And the devil was wily enough to slither in there and lead them away. If you think you don't need the whole armor of God to deal with him, then you need to do some more thinking and a whole bunch of praying. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Ruler, these are, these are high-renowned ruler-type beings against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts created above us. Hebrews says we're created below the angels. We're behind even before we get started. The only hope we have is Jesus Christ. Amen, amen for those amens. Of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the, here he repeats it, the whole armor of God. Don't sell yourself short. Get everything God has that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, in the evil day. Now, we all have evil days. And we need to be able to handle those evil days by hiding behind Jesus or rather in Jesus. We need to put on Jesus. He's, he is the whole armor of God. We put on Jesus so that we can stand any evil day, but especially the evil day. Now, there's an evil day coming on this planet. 
And if you and I are fortunate enough to be alive when that evil day comes, and the reason I say fortunate is because it is a great honor and a high privilege to be re here to represent Jesus Christ during the greatest time of battle that the universe will ever see. Amen. It is a great privilege. Amen. And I pray that God allows me to live through the time of trouble. Amen. But if he, if he chooses not to, that's his business. But I want to be able to stand in the evil day. That's why I need to be able to stand in every evil day leading up to the evil day. And if I'm not, if I'm not uh, preparing, if I'm not engaging, if I'm not using the weapons of God that we're going to hear about in just a minute, if I'm not learning how to use those, there's no way I'll stand in the evil day. I won't even stand in the day today. I'll just flop around and try to fake people out or something. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. Truth right here around your, 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 your body. In ancient times when they'd wrestle, they wore these belts, these leather belts that had handles on them. And they would grab each other by the handles. They could throw each other out of the ring. If they threw you out of the ring, you lose. The devil cannot handle the truth. He can't, that means he can't grab you if you're wearing the truth. The truth will protect you. If he tries to grab you, it's like grabbing white hot, almost melting steel. And he can't handle it. God's truth is something he can't deal with. Amen. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness to cover your vital organs, your heart, your lungs, your liver, you know, these, the, the visceral organs here in the, in the chest and the abdominal area. You've got to be protected. The devil knows right where to get you. And if you don't have the breastplate of Christ, righteousness, you'll go down. He'll stab you right through your heart. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, standing on the rock of ages, Amen. firmly planted on the word of God. And when I said a minute ago, he'll stab you right through your heart, some of you know how that feels. You've been broke, you've had your heart stabbed. You've been brokenhearted. You've been run over. You've been abused. You've been mistreated. And I tell you what, it wasn't flesh and blood that was doing that. The devil was just disguised behind that flesh and blood. They didn't know what they were doing, but the devil knew what he was doing when he crushed your spirit. But Jesus knows how to heal it. He knows how to apply the ointment of his salve, of his healing, sweet spirit. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Amen? Amen. Rock of ages. That's where we're standing. You make sure where you're standing. If somebody says, why do you believe that? Well, I don't know my church teaches that. That is not good enough. That will not cut it. When the devil comes along and he challenges you, you and you're going to say, well, get out of here based on what my church says. No, 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 no. It's got to be get out of here, Satan, based on what Jesus says. Get behind me. I'm redeemed with the blood of the lamb. You can't touch me. You can't own me. You can't lead me because Jesus is my good shepherd. Based on Psalm 23 and based on 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, I've been purchased with the blood of Jesus. You've got to be able to say it from thus saith the Lord. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 Above all, above all, most important of all is to take on the shield of faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. You are saved by grace through faith. God could pour all the grace. In fact, he has poured all the grace he has upon the human race. But most of them are not going to be saved because they won't use the faith that has been given to every human being. God has given every man a measure of faith, according to Romans. But most of the human race will not put on this faith. They will not use what God has already given them, and they will be lost if they do not put on the faith shield of God 
with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The enemy is going to come on you with everything he's got. And I got, I got some bad news for the whole human race. The whole human race has never seen everything he's got. Unless, unless they've seen the cross. Unless you've seen what the devil did at the cross, you haven't seen everything he's got. But soon, during the time of trouble, you will not only see everything he's got, you will feel everything he's got. You will experience everything he's got because God's going to allow him to run at the human race with everything he's got. And the only people who will be able to stand are the people who are standing in the whole armor of God and have the seal of the living God. The fullness of Jesus Christ. And if you don't want to pay the price to get the whole armor of God, you better start praying right now to let you, for God to let you die before the time of trouble. And I'm not saying that lightly. Because once we pass into the time of trouble, no one will be able to handle it unless, except for those who have what we're talking about right here, right now. Amen. Amen. And if I don't warn you this clear, if I don't make it this clear, and this plane, your blood would be on me. And I don't have any room for that. My home's in heaven. Amen. I got reservations for the streets of gold. Amen. And God called me to be a pastor. He called me to be a preacher first, and then an evangelist, and then a pastor. And if I don't warn everybody clearly and plainly, then I'm in big trouble. I might as well be out picking cotton somewhere. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. I love this. The helmet of salvation to protect your brain. We can't even think right unless we have the salvation of Jesus Christ. I need my brain protected. Somebody says, oh, you Christians, you're just brainwashed. I said, amen, brother, give me double. I'll take a double brainwashing today <laughs> with a beautiful life of Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. Somebody says, oh, you're, all, you're, a, you're against sin. You're anti this. I won't even tell what they say, but you're anti, anti, anti. No, I'm not anti anything. I'm pro Jesus. And if he gets in the way of your sin, then go kill him. Don't kill me. I'm not, the, I'm not God. I dare you to try to kill him again. Not happening. But the devil's going to try. He's going to try to kill Jesus when he comes the second time. And then he's going to try to kill him 1,000 years later. He's going to try three times. He didn't kill Jesus the first time. A lot of people teach that it was the devil. He didn't kill Jesus. My sins, your sins, Adam's sins produces death. The wages of sin is death. The devil did not kill Jesus. The Jews did not kill Jesus. The Romans did not kill Jesus. The sins of Adam and the sins of all of Adam's children were placed on him by the Father, according to Isaiah 53, and sin produces death. But praise God, he's alive. Amen. I can't explain all that, but I know it's true, because when I talk to the Father in the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit always shows up to do good things. That's real. Hallelujah. Man, I could dance on that one. Wow. Take the helmet of salvation. Oh, that's what David sang so much for. That's why he sang so much. He had the helmet of salvation. And he sang all the time. It's amazing. And the sword of the Spirit. Catch this. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Do you know in Hebrews 4 it says that the Word of God is a two-edged sword. Well, here it is. Here's the two-edged sword right here. It's the Spirit and the Word. Amen. The sword of the Spirit, which is also the Word of God, because they always work together. Amen. Isn't that exciting? Amen. Amen. Some people know the Bible so good, it's all head knowledge, and they don't have the Spirit, and they're the most miserable people to live with, and they're the most miserable people there is. And then some people claim they have the Spirit, but they don't know the Word of God, and they're jumping all over the place with every doctrine and every wind and every crazy thing you can imagine, and they're all messed up. And I have to tell you that I've been in both places before, and it's so much happier, it's so much better just to surrender and say, oh God, give me that. 
Give me the Spirit and the Word in equal measure, in balance. The Word is the bread of life. The Spirit is the breath of life. Isn't that awesome? And when you say, give us this day our daily bread, that's what, we're ta- that's what God's talking about. Your heavenly food is more important than your earthly food. In fact, he says, if you put this food first, I'll make sure you get all the other stuff. Amen. Amen. Where's that at? You ameners, where's that at? You know where that promise is? I know you know, Josh. It's one of your favorite verses. I disguised it a little bit. Matthew 6, 33. Right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Allelu, alleluia. And though all the things that are added is the stuff he just talked about. The food and the clothing and the sparrows. They know what they're going to. He's talking about. And then he says, but rather seek first the sword of the spirit, breath of life. And the word of God, the bread of life. Amen? Amen. Praying always. Praying always. Amen. Amen. Walking in prayer. Always connected with heaven. Amen. Amen. And, and, And the Lord told me to do three things when I started pastoring. Because pastoring is kind of a scary proposition for a, a country bumpkin like me, you know, some kid from, some football player from Hooker, Oklahoma. Pastoring can be kind of scary when you're 21 years old, you know. It's scary when you're 61 years old. If you're not hiding behind Jesus, it gets real scary. And so I was praying. I, actually, I ran from God for four years. I stopped. I wouldn't preach. I preached when I was 17. I didn't preach again. I said, no way. You're never going to get me up there again. And I'm done with that. And Forget Christianity, I'm out of here. And, I, and then when, when I finally realized that I wasn't going to get out of this alive, that if I didn't obey him, I was going to be gone, I said, okay, God, I'll do this on one condition. Now, most people don't, don't agree. They, they tell you you shouldn't make deals with God. I don't buy that for a minute. Gideon made deals with God, and he, he ended up pretty good. Anyway, I made, and Jacob made some pretty big deals with God, and he ended up pretty good, too. Anyway, I made a deal. I said, God, on one condition, I'll do this. And we were having this conversation. You know, if you get alone with God often enough, long enough, he, you'll actually start hearing him. He's talking to us all the time, but we don't spend enough time waiting on the Lord. The Bible says, blessed are those who wait upon the Lord. For they shall renew their strength. And when you hear God's voice, it puts power in your bones. Jeremiah said, it's fire in my bones. So most people don't, don't make an appointment with God. They just, oh, if they think about it, they do it. And if they don't, oh, well, you know, nobody else is doing it. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, I'm alone with God. And, I, and he's hounding me. He's hounding me big time. He's hammering me. You either do this or you're going to be destroyed and there's nothing I can do for you. That's what he made very clear. I said, on one condition. He said, what's that? And he, he did. He said, what's that? God can speak English, you know. He can speak any language there is and then create a whole bunch more. And he said, what's that? He knew what I was going to tell him before he said, what's that? Right? But he's condescending to have a conversation with me. And he said, what's that? And I said, as long as you'll be with me, The same way you were with those guys in the book of Acts, then I'm your man. And then he answered this, and this is what he said. He said, word for word, I remember this conversation, word for word. He said, evidently, you did not read the fine print, Paul. And my mind thought, what's he talking about the fine? There's no fine print in the book of Acts. It's all the same print, you know. And then then all of a sudden it hit, oh, he's talking about a contract. And I go, yeah, well, what's the fine print? And he says, I don't do business any other way. He said, anybody trying to do this other than the way they did it in the book of Acts are not running for me. They're just playing church. That's what he told me. It's okay. I can handle that. And that's what it means to pray without ceasing. Always in prayer. 
And so God got me up this morning, and I'm praying. But before I was praying, I was singing. And if you don't take time to sing to the Lord early in the mornings, you are just cheating yourself out of one of the most wonderful experiences in the universe. Seriously. You need to be, some, you need to be doing some really serious reconsiderations about your, your schedule and about your priorities. If you're not scheduling serious, huge blocks of time to be alone with the creator, living God of the universe, and to just slow down enough to where you just sing some of the songs like, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Amen. Amen. Or holy, holy, holy. So God told me three things. You guys thought I was going to forget, didn't you? He told me this three things you need to do to succeed as a pastor. I said, what's that? He said, you lift up Jesus with all you know how. In everything, everywhere you go. Anywhere you, no matter what you're doing, make sure that Jesus is getting lift up, lifted up. I've actually had church members come and complain to me that I talk too much about Jesus. Seriously. I said, praise God. I'm going to talk more. And they just, and they walk away. Second, preach the word of God without fail or favor. Don't water it down for anybody. Don't change it for any, don't, the rich people will try to pressure you and get you to not be so heavy on proper Sabbath keeping because they want to go out to the restaurants on Sabbath. And I'm making this real plain because I do not want your blood on me, people. I love you too much to betray you. If you think God's word authorizes the buying and selling on Sabbath, then you might as well go be a Presbyterian. God's word says no buying or selling on Sabbath unless it's an emergency. And going to the restaurant, having someone fix this delicate dish and this fancy little thing and serving you and the music and the air conditioning, that's not a cornfield. Jesus picked food out of a cornfield, not a restaurant, not an air-conditioned restaurant. Amen. Amen. I had no idea I was going to preach a Sabbath message. Wow. <laughs> Funny, this scripture would come up. Therefore, submit. To your creator. Resist the devil. If you think the Holy Spirit is leading you. And I'm going to hammer this. And if you don't like it. You're free to leave. This is America. If you think the Holy Spirit is leading you. To go and pay your servants. That's what waiters are. And cooks are. On the Sabbath to cook for you. You need to tear Exodus 20 verse 8 through 11. Right out of your Bible. And say that no longer applies to the human race. And I know people say, don't tell Pastor Paul that we went to the restaurant this Sabbath. Why? I'm nobody. What can I? I can't do anything. <laughs> That's just silly. It is. Don't tell Pastor Paul we went to this X-rated movie. He doesn't believe in that. Who cares? Who cares what I believe in? I'm nobody. You better care what he believes in. And he sings a little song. Be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. Because there's a devil on the earth trying to eat you up. And it's real. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He's already there. Amen. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. They think I'm a, a straight Fiery preacher. Man, I wish we had James preaching today. Can you, you read the book of James? He's hardcore. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Wow. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Oh, yeah. And he, this is chapter 4. In chapter 1, he says, those who lack wisdom, let them ask of God. He'll give it to you free of charge. All you want. He says, but don't, 
Don't let a double-minded person think he's going to receive anything from God. And somebody says, well, what's a double-minded person? That's a person that serves two masters. Convenient Christians. They serve the Lord on certain things, but they serve the flesh on the things that they think are more, more uh, important. Lament and mourn. You know, lament and mourn. I don't think James would have a megachurch. <laughs> Megachurches don't preach very much about repentance from sin. They tickle everybody's ears and make them feel good. You know, you have a dog, you tickle his ear and he'll come back for more food. And they tickle those ears all the time. They're ear ticklers. That's what Paul calls them in Timothy, 1 Timothy 3. He says, they're tickling your ears. I don't think James was an ear tickler. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Praise God. Humble yourself. And here's what Peter has to say about it. Likewise, you younger people, uh-oh, now, now this, this is not, by the way, this is not the popular way to, to, to grow a youth, a youth ministry. To tell the young people to submit to the older people. That doesn't work. They, they want to, we'll start a young person's church over here and the old folks can go over there. We just won't even go to church together. That's what they're doing. But this is what God says. Young people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. You know, people are, it's a big thing to quote now that Paul says that he does not allow women to usurp authority of a man. I'm here to tell you that if Paul were here right now today, the Apostle Paul, he would say that he doesn't allow any other men to usurp authority from other men either. You don't do that in the church. You don't go and usurp and undermine and manipulate and scheme and get somebody's job out of school duggery. You don't do that. That's what usurping is. You're undermining. You're backstabbing. You're, you're spreading false rumors and you, you manipulate to where you get the job instead of the man. Well, there were women doing that back in, in, in first century because they had just come from the pagan religions where the women were in charge because the, the pagan religions were all sex cults. And you couldn't worship in the pagan temples unless you had illicit prostitute sex with the women. And they held the power. They were in control. As they got converted, they thought they could take over the church. Well, we don't have that problem anymore. Like that. But if some man comes in here and tries to take away... Say, say somebody came in and, and started scheming to try to, to, to take away your ministry... Anybody that has any intelligence or decency at all is, is going to not allow that to happen, right? So it's a principle we need to look at. Be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, in due season. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Peter understood this as good as anybody ever. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Peter knew that. The devil had him in his mouth. And Jesus said, but I have prayed for you, Peter. Amen. Satan's tried to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Peter. And when you finally get converted, I want you to feed my lambs. Now I'm going to get real clear. If you're a Christian, if you claim to be a Christian... If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then you need to be praying with other believers really every day, but at least in the middle of the week. Now, that doesn't have to be with me present, but you need to be doing it somewhere, preferably in your home and with your neighbors. Most Christians don't even know whether their neighbors are Christians. They can live 10 years beside somebody and then find out 10 years, well, this is, these guys are Christians. I didn't know they were Christians. Well, you should have known. You should have gone and, and, and gone fishing. You know, if I don't make it real clear, then I'm the one in trouble and you'll get to go to heaven and I'm not, I'll be left out. We are called by God 
to put on the whole armor of God. Somebody says, oh, you don't have to go to church. You'd be a Christian. You don't have to go to church. Really? You know, if you're a Christian, you're in church 24-7. You are the church. If you're a Christian, everywhere you go is church. And the things that people do in church is what you do wherever you're at. Your brother, the same sufferings, people are suffering. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. Suffering is good for a Christian. There's no other way around it. Hebrews says that wisdom comes through suffering. You pray for wisdom, and then you start suffering. Oh, God, please don't let me suffer. And so he takes the suffering away, and you still need wisdom. Oh, God, give me wisdom. He brings suffering. Oh, God, take the suffering away, but I need wisdom. And then you, what? <laughs> if you give your suffering to the Lord in childlike faith, your rejoicing will never be diminished. You can praise God in the middle of a heart attack. I believe that. I've seen people do it. But it, it's, it's childlike. Our last scriptures. Why would we do all this for God? Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct. God calls the, the world without Christ aimless, pointless. Received conduct, received that you received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. <clears throat> We're under attack. Some of, some of us are bleeding. We're wounded. We, we need a lot of help. Me, me, I need a lot of help. The claim jumper, Satan, is lying to everybody on the earth. It's just what you do with those lies. He's lying to you. He's lying to you every day. He throws his lies at everybody. And most people don't even recognize when he's talking. But as soon as you recognize that the devil talking to you, there's no reason to get afraid that some demon's talking to you. Just say, I belong to Jesus. He bought me with his blood. Take your garbage somewhere else. And he has to go. Because when you mention the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit explodes like a mighty atomic bomb. Amen. And it blows all the darkness away. It, it has no choice. It has to go. That's the way it is. When you apply faith behind the name of Jesus or in the name of Jesus or for the name of Jesus, the enemy's got to flee. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, can, uh, ask yourself this. Do you ever talk to God about the blood that he shed? If you don't talk to him very much about the blood that he shed, then you're, then you're probably going to get run over by the devil and just, and just be really confused and wondering, why did God let that happen? Or why did that happen? You know, I'm just, not, I'm just going to quit going to church. That church doesn't do anything for me. Well, how can the church do anything for you if you're not doing anything yourself. The greatest thing a human being can do for themselves is to present the blood of Christ at the throne of grace and say, Father, I'm here. I'm here based on the blood of Jesus. I'm here on the authority of your love poured out in the blood of Jesus to be saved from my sins, to be filled with your power, to put on the whole armor of God. I'm here to get everything you've got, Father, based on the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why it says they overcame by the blood of Jesus. God is longing for you to step up to the throne of grace as a priest, as a new covenant priest. And priests present blood. That's what the Old Testament priests did. did. That's what the New Testament priests do. 
In the new covenant, every believer is a priest, not just people from a certain tribe. Every believer is a priest. How do you deal with a claim jumper? How do you deal with Satan? You present the blood of Christ to the Father for all of his kingdom. And when the devil comes around, you present the devil the blood of Christ and say, I bring the blood of Christ against you, Satan. Stay out of my home. Stay out of my marriage. Stay out of my life. Stay away from my job. Stay away. In fact, get behind me, Satan. Jesus said, if you believe in me, Jesus talking, the very works I've done, you'll do. And that's what Jesus did. When Satan tried to hammer him, he said, Satan, get behind me. It is written. That's all we need to do. And the word of their testimony, and this is the last thing I want to say. I've decided my testimony needs to be his testimony. Amen. His testimony needs to be mine. I mean, my testimony is, Father, I'm asking you to give me everything I need to succeed as a human being and everything I need to succeed as a minister of the gospel based on the testimony of Jesus Christ. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Everything you need to succeed as a human being and everything you need to succeed as a minister of the gospel is in Matthew 6, 33. And it's also in Philippians 4, 19 where he says, Father, I'm here based on the testimony of Jesus that he spoke through the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.19 that my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. That's how I'm here, Father. I, this is my testimony. It's your testimony. Amen. Amen. And that takes practice. The Holy Spirit is the coach. And he will run you through boot camp a boot camp like you've never been through, but worth going through, very guaranteed worth going through. He ran me through boot camp for three years. From 1975 to 78, I thought my brain would explode. I thought my life would never come out of the spiral and of the craziness and of the insanity that was going on in my life. But God was leading, and man, I came out of that three-year period Praising God that I didn't have to go through that again as long as I held on to Jesus with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I would never have to spend that time in the desert again. Amen. And I'm not, I don't want to go back. I do not want to go back there. That's why I cry out to Jesus every morning. If you're in the desert, if your life is just like a big washing machine just knocking everything all over the place and you don't know what in the world is going to happen next, Call on Jesus. Put on the whole armor of God. Stand in the evil day. I want to invite you to stand right now with me if you'd like. If you can. And I guarantee you if Mark Ford could, he'd be standing right now. And I, and I venture this, when the 144,000 show up, he may just throw that wheelchair away. And he may just be one of the 144,000. But he may, he, he, he can still do the work of the 144,000, even in a wheelchair, because God is greater than any wheelchair. Amen. That, that wheelchair doesn't limit Mark. Mark goes door to door in that thing. <laughs> it's, in fact, it's one of the, I'd rather go door to door with Mark than most people. Because they look out, they don't want to slam the door on a man in a wheelchair. And he just, and on Mark, he just delivers the word. Shoo. Because God softened their heart. Because God uses all things for his glory. And he causes all things to work for his glory. Praise God. Mark, come on up here, man. You ain't heavy, you're my brother, brother. He got him a new wheelchair. We were wishing he'd have gotten that faster model, but... I think he was too. How fast does this thing go, Mark? Five. Five miles an hour. How fast did the other one go? Five. No, the, the new one. The, the About nine. Nine. Man, you can almost double your speed, brother. <laughs> I tell you, the people that feel sorry for Mark are just wasting their time. 
because he doesn't feel sorry for himself. He's got the victory because he has the blood of Jesus and he has the testimony of Jesus. Is that right, Mark? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. In fact, Mark, I'm going to let you pray, brother. I'd love to hear you pray. Go ahead and pray. In that. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray in a very special way that you would give us the boldness, the courage to stand for you in all circumstances. Yes. We pray, pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are yes. suffering for the gospel. We pray not so much that you deliver them, but give them the courage to continue to be bold yes. and to hold on to you. Help us as we face our different trials and temptations that we might shine for you regardless of the circumstances and be witnesses against the devil and his kingdom. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you. God bless you. See you here, there, or in the air because he's coming back for us. Amen.